Well, hi. It's Friday night, so it must be another evening of P1. Good evening and welcome. Uh, just taking a quick look at the chat panel. Welcome, 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 everybody there. Nice to see you all making it tonight. Just I was just noticing how many papers some of you are doing. Well, all credits here, no doubt, in relation to that. Hi, hi. Okay, well, I suppose we're going to have to make a start for this evening. With uh, Tonight we've got two chapters to get through. Last time we only did one. We looked at chapter three, so tonight's going to be a, a, a little bit, you know, going to make sure that we're dealing with it. But they're not big chapters. They're not as big as, uh, as the issues were last time. So it won't be, won't, be, won't be too much of a push. Let's say that. University of Texas. No, I mustn't. I often keep reading the chat panel, must I? Unless there's something of uh, great significance for me. What we need to do is to push on. So down to the 2D mix. As normal, there we are. I'll just minimise that out of the way. And away we go. Not really going to be so concerned with uh, introduction. I mean, we went through kind of issues last time. The only thing that, that sort of came out of it was is that we're talking about the board of directors and chapter three of the notes. You know, in terms of good governance, chapter three of the notes talks to us about the composition of the board. So we went through ideas like two-tier boards and unitary boards, non-executive directors, chairman and CEO, stroke the need for a CEO chair split. In other words, we decided who was going to be sitting around the table on our board of directors. We then turned our attention to the operation of the board, and that asked us really to just look at some activities or tasks, you know, what they need to focus on, what they should be doing whilst they're sitting around the table. And the, the conclusion that we drew from that was that we could advise them appropriately in terms of induction at the beginning of the year and for non-executive directors. And at the end of the year, we can talk to them about the importance of performance appraisal, both of which seem pretty straightforward, pretty, pretty low-key in many ways. Not too difficult to say something in relation to those. Uh, if there is a difficulty, then during the year, during the year, we needed to make sure that they provide adequate levels of service. And so this led us into two issues. The more significant one, although as I said to you last time, I'm not really sure it's going to be examined this time because it came up last time, but you need a sense of legal duties. Something I probably didn't say, but legal duties are important, not just in terms of the question that came up last time, which I asked you about it but also in terms of ethics, because after all, the basis of ethics, the foundation for ethics, or a foundation for ethics, is to make sure we're obeying the law. So meeting our duties is not just a legal consideration, it's also an ethical requirement for us to make sure we're doing that. Anyway, apart from the legal issues, there was also a governance issue in terms of providing service, and that governance issue, which was a bit unusual, but okay, it related to re-election, and that if we're going to survive re-election, we need to make sure we're doing the job. We went through code references for all of them, but I'm not writing them down, because although, as I say, I mention them, I'm less concerned about that as an issue. So those were the areas in terms of Chapter 3. We can then now extend it slightly as we get to Chapter 4, in order to suggest that a final element to a board of directors, a final function, a final requirement, if you like, quite often, is, is that there's a need for delegation of activities. And so that being the case, of course, what I'm discussing here is the use of committees. Now, we're already aware of committees. We were right back on evening one. We talked about risk committees and audit committees. So it's no surprise that committees are, are part of this discussion. So this is the first half of the night, or the first area of the night anyway, which is going to be chapter four. There it is, if you're following it through, in terms of the notes, board committees is what the discussion is about. Examinability, well, always a popular topic, although in truth it's been examined quite a bit of late, I feel, within the last year and a half or so. So I'm not as convinced, maybe, as I would be, but we do need to, to look at it. There is some stuff within it that is examinable regardless of the, the detail of what came up last time. So, board committees will 
form the basis of it. Once we've done that, we can then close the book, if you like, in terms of these early areas of corporate governance. Now, of course, as I say, you are aware that there are some variety in relation to this because right from the first night, we identified right from very early on, we were talking about Enron, we were talking about audit committees. Um, I also mentioned to you as I was running through the syllabus, but it was on the first night, uh, issues of risk committees, and so to get a sense in relation to that as an area. Because um, the other two are the need to think about nomination as an issue, and the need to think about remuneration. So overall on the syllabus, there are four committees. You might be asked to consider the role of any one of them, what they do. You might be asked to offer some advice in relation to making improvements in terms of what they do as an issue. Yeah, there was a strong element of nomination as far as the last paper was concerned. I did say to you, you know, about, that, uh, about that as an issue. Need to think about diversity on the board, of course, was what the question was about. Anyway, sticking to the point. So there are four committees that we need to look at. It's just that as far as this chapter is concerned, it's a relatively small chapter, and that's because it doesn't consider the first two, which is actually quite obvious because later on, as we go through the evenings, we need to talk about internal control, don't we, as one of the topics in governance. So when we talk about internal control, then that obviously is the opportunity for us to talk about who deals with internal control, which is an audit committee. So best place, although they exist, best placed in the right place, which is in a later chapter. Equally it's true as far as risk committees are concerned. We will see audit committees in chapter nine. We won't consider uh, beginning of chapter four it is, as far as I know it's concerned. We won't consider risk committees until we get on to chapter 10, because that's when we'll be looking at risk management as an issue. So worth being aware of here, but not going to be the focus. So the only thing the, the chapter really deals with is, is firstly talking about nomination and giving us something in relation to that, but as you just said, examine, but we're going to do everything anyway. And then the back end of it discusses uh, remuneration as an issue. However, now what I've already said, what I've already said is, is that whatever committee is, whatever the committee is that you need to discuss, the main point about it is, is to give a sense as to what they do, what their roles are. So obviously the roles of an audit committee will be somewhat different in terms of the roles of a risk committee or nomination or remuneration. So you need to identify the differences that exist and what, what the specific task is that they need to perform. However, having said that, what you'll notice at the beginning of chapter four is, is that the way I open it is to kind of give a sense of a common role to suggest that whatever they do particularly, in the end they are all, all four of them, are committees. And so there are certain aspects to the way in which they operate, there are certain aspects to their role or roles that they have in common. <clears throat> so that's useful to you. Because very often in the question, it's not just about understanding their job, but it's also about criticising the way they behave, how they operate, how they uh, enact those particular functions. So this is, uh, I think this, is, this works quite well as an idea. So regardless of whether we're talking about audit, or whether it's risk, or whether it's nomination, or whether it's remuneration, there is a common thread as far as all of them are concerned. So I'll do it diagrammatically. If we say that's the board, and if we say that that is any given committee, then there are certain common roles that you could emphasise and, and, you know, and talk about advantages in relation to these committees as well. I mean, for instance, as far as the board is concerned, it is about delegation, isn't it? So it enables them to offload that particular issue. Risk would be a good example of that because the board of directors might be involved, might deal with risk itself, or it might decide to delegate the function to a particular uh, committee. So if there is delegation involved in it, then the board of directors can refocus their attention to other issues that are critical for them. So rather than getting into in-depth analysis in terms of safety or in terms of environmental risk or whatever it might be, the board decides to offload those issues, enabling it to refocus on strategy, which is of course what it's really all about.